Welcome to the Beard End Podcast. Tonight, Ethan and I are going to get smashed. No, I don't want to say smashed. Tonight on the Beard End Podcast, we're going to do ASMR drinking. Let, let's hop right into it. Welcome to the Beard End Podcast. Tonight, we're going to hop right into it. Tonight on the Beard End Podcast, we get into why I shove cheese sticks up my... B- All right, we've got two and a half minutes. One of these has to be good. <laughs> no, why? Hey everybody, welcome back to another episode of the Beer Den Podcast. So, beer of the month this month was... Put in an actual drum roll there. (laughs) Drum roll, please. Which one was it? I don't even remember. It was... So, beer of the month... (laughs) The beer of the month this month was... Our highest rated New Belgian Fat Tire. Woo! The Amber Ale. It scored, what was the score on that? 81? A lot. Booyah! 81. 81. We won't go into a description of why we liked it. No, nope, you're going to have to go watch that episode. Yeah, but if you want to know what we loved and hated about it, go ahead and check out that episode on CastBox or... YouTube. YouTube. Our YouTube channel. Don't forget, I'm going to plug it. Don't forget, we also have a Patreon. If you like what you're hearing or don't like, let us know. I'm not by by that. subscribing to Patreon. Yeah. Let us <laughs> really know. Really stick it to us by Stick it to us by s- subscribing donating money to our $5 so that we can level. continue to drink beer and review them. Hey, you're saving yourself money. Because we're going to taste all the bad beers and then save you from having to buy them and experience that yourself. Exactly. Basically, you're losing money by not subscribing to our Patreon. Exactly. And for $10, $10, right? Sure. For $10, you can join our mug club. Ooh. You get a custom mug with our logo on it. Hey. Early access to the podcast. Insider scoops on what's happening in the beer den. Yeah. It's pretty good perks. You should check it out. But yeah, just ten dollars. Every day, low price gets you all that. That's www.patreon.com slash the beard end podcast. The government's back open. Hey! We finally came to some sort of agreement. I don't know if there's like details on it or if they're just agreeing to open up the government for three i know it's three we weeks have, we have, yeah we have until like sometime in february yeah i think it's february 15th or so and then trump saying we're gonna shut down again if we don't come up with an agreement but they at least opened it they guaranteed back pay for all those employees that haven't received paychecks i believe today was the second paycheck yeah the that they second didn't one receive. that they're gonna miss yeah um i'm actually shocked anything happened with that like i don't know uh, i wasn't expecting it and all of a sudden just yeah like earlier today i heard something about it and i was like oh well that's a surprise i think what's weird about it is the fact that they can shut down the government and they can have all these employees like you're not getting paychecks anymore yeah yet congress the president all these people still are getting their paychecks yeah like they're not I mean, granted, like, they get a lot of money being in the position that they're in, but they're still getting paid. It's Yeah, it sucks, but, I mean, I don't know. It's, it's not like they're going to vote to be like, yeah, when the government shuts down, I'm not going to get paid either. But that's that's, what, you know, it kind of should be that way, though. Like, you think if the government shut down, why is any part of the government getting more money than down. the other? Yeah. But there was a... Uh, I can't remember... Wilbur Ross, that's his name. I can't remember what his position. Secretary of something. Solid. Um, He came out and he made a statement this week of why I don't understand why people who haven't, that have been affected by this, government employees that haven't received a paycheck, why they're going to food shelters or homeless shelters. Oh, was it just like a really tone deaf yeah, kind of and that's like, what it came on yeah. out with. And he even he went a little bit further to say, like, 
if you're struggling for money because of this, you should go to the bank and you should get a loan. I, I do remember hearing something about that. It's just sort of like this ridiculous statement. It's sort of like, you know, saying, well, it's character building and like, it just like very passing it off like, or like, yeah. uh, or just brushing it off. Like it's nothing when like, clearly it's not affecting you at all. And it's just, it just, it's super tone deaf to like, what what the experience is to not have a paycheck uh right. you know for two weeks in, or well no it's well at the time he made the statement it was reality. technically one paycheck that they had lost and now i don't know if they do their paychecks on a weekly or bi-weekly basis yeah but yeah. i want to dissect what he said a little bit oh, yeah. so like that second part about like they should just go to the bank and get a loan for these troubling times because they're going to get back pay that's stupid to me that screams that he has an interest in the banks and that he somehow makes money off of banking institutions it'd be interesting to see like if somebody like looks into that and sees some kind of relation yeah if there if there is something there that's like some sort of an incentive to like push people into you know going to the banks for help Mm -hmm. i i think it's probably just a guy who's completely out of touch Right. with what the effects of not getting paid for a week are you know he probably for him it's like getting not getting paid for a week so like he he could probably not get paid you know i don't know his situation i don't know the guy but it may be a situation where he could not get paid for the rest of his life and he'd probably technically be fine you know now wealth really kind of messes with your perspective right now, something that I do agree with him a little bit is his statement of not understanding how missing one paycheck is putting these people into having to go to food shelters, homeless shelter, or sorry, food pantries and homeless shelters. Yeah. If they're missing one payment, like one paycheck. To me, and this is going to come off harsh, but if missing one paycheck like yes that's gonna add stress to you yeah and you for that week might not be able to afford some stuff but to me if you're missing one paycheck and that puts you out of your home or that puts you to where you can't afford food on the table you're probably spending money where you shouldn't be well but you don't know everybody's situation where there may be people who that you know they really are paycheck to paycheck the only amount of money that they have for food that week is what they got last week but and like there is no room for saving you know it, it's just there are there probably a lot of people who do fall into that where it's like they probably just weren't saving you know they decided to spend a little extra you know maybe they I don't know. They bought something just the week before that they you know, probably didn't need. And so now I'm really banking on this paycheck because rents next week, you know, but I was planning on having this, you know, to be able to pay for it. You know, I don't know. I don't know their situation. And, that, it, and that's true. And like, I've been paycheck to paycheck before, but at the same time, part of being responsible is planning like your finances. Yeah. And like I could see, okay, rent's due this week and I have just enough money to cover the rent and then I'm going to get paid Friday. Yeah. And then, oh man, I got sick and had to go to the hospital. That's an unforeseen expense. And so now you're struggling. And maybe that's some of the reasoning. It's just there's a lot of un, unexpected expenses. But at the same time, like if that's not the thing, if it's, there is no unexpected if it's like, oh, well, I had to buy groceries on Tuesday and my rent was due on Thursday and I was really banking on I needed to have my paycheck on Friday. I don't know. I just feel like feel there's like a the, little bit more that into they could play have there. Like, to like maybe they should have cut back on some of their other stuff or maybe like maybe their rent payment is too high for what they can actually afford. Like maybe they can scrape by and do it, but part of being i think financially stable is living within your means i mean i could go out and i could get a apartment for twelve hundred dollars a month and afford that for a little bit but i couldn't long term because that's not financially viable 
But I guess what I would say is that these people are living within their means. Like, is it absurd to expect that I am employed and so I should be able to expect my paycheck? And so I am living like I can survive just fine as long as I have that paycheck. And like, that's what I have everything planned out, you know, is, uh, is around that, right. you know, I mean, like it, the thing is, is like, how do you plan for that? Even for me, like I have student debt and like I could go a couple of paychecks maybe, but like, you know, if I get a car and I get, you know, a house or something that kind of goes away where I very well may be, I may have some saved up, but I'm definitely going to need, you know, my paychecks to come in. And if they aren't, it's not going to be long till I'm screwed. And like, I have nothing, I have no way of paying my student loan. And now I have no way, you know, and then for a lot of these people, you throw in a kid, you know, all the expenses, expenses that come with that, you know, I don't know. It's really easy to get into a position where it's just like, uh, it works, you know, you know, but it just works. You know, I, I think those are all valid arguments. I guess my hope is that people will understand and take away from this, that there's more to being financially stable than just, I can pay all my bills. Yeah. Like there needs to be a cushion, so to speak, between I can pay all my bills and then I also have leftover money for the unforeseeable, for fun money, whatever you want to call it. And not just, I have just enough. Well, I wouldn't doubt if this whole experience would definitely put people, uh, would kind of turn people off to the idea of working for the government to the idea of working for the government when there is the potential that my employment doesn't mean I get paid, you know, and it's going to be really interesting if people start to move away from the positions that they're in now, just because of this kind of a thing that's like, well, you know, if it's not a sure thing that I'm going to get paid, then I don't want to be there. Cause I, I, you know, I'm not in a place to be able to handle that. I think so. that opens up a whole nother can of worms, so to speak, though, is every I think people forget that like their jobs aren't necessarily secure. Like you can be really good at your job and that company could decide, hey, we're shutting down tomorrow. So like you're not guaranteed to have a job tomorrow. And most states are actually like an at will workplace where yeah like we could go into work tomorrow and our boss could not like the shirt that we wear and they could just say you're fired and while that opens them up to litigation yeah there's other but things they but... could technically do that they might just not get away with it yeah. long term but it could still be something that happens and so like i think there's that sense of well i've got a job so you have to keep paying me regardless of whether i'm working or not like this is my money before I've earned it. I mean, people get laid off all the time and while it sucks, it's kind of a part of life. And so that's where you need to have, I guess, a backup plan to be financially stable besides just, I have just enough. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's, it's a tough balance because like everybody's situation, it changes on a day, you know, somebody who, did have that kind of uh stability where they had kind of a pool of money that was for emergencies you know they were saving up to you know maybe get a bigger house you know they they were doing everything right next thing you know car accident later you know a busted up leg now all of that stuff that you had been working to save up maybe going into some sort of medical bills you know or you know, maybe now you can't work, you know, there's, or, or maybe you have to take like a different position that is more, you know, an office position opposed to something where you'd be up moving, you know, it's just, it sucks because no matter how much you plan, 
it can go south really easily. Right. The best you can do is just try to be prepared to the best of your ability. And I think that's what I think more people, not just those affected by the shutdown, but more people in general just need to be more financially prepared for things. Well, I think that's like, that's like a whole thing unto itself is like people's, uh, understanding and kind of financial knowledge like it's not really taught in, taught in schools very well man like even as even as far as schools go like they're so understaffed you mm-hmm. know there's a whole stuff that's going on out in california there was like uh you know teacher walkouts teacher strikes, and yeah. teacher strikes and i stuff. think they resolved that finally they did they did but like i mean when you have a classroom of 40 people like that's ridiculous you can't you can't be like servicing all these kids to the degree that they really should be you know when you have 40 people for 45 minutes right you know like you have one minute to like maybe to like get to everybody that's ridiculous you're not Right, and those, not be able to that's do just it. not. Yeah, it's just not acceptable, really. Yeah, like I mean, I don't know. It, it there the definitely needs to be. Yeah, there definitely needs to be more education. I think. I mean, there's no harm in educating yourself in anything. I think the thing is, is that the people who who pay into education are the ones that it doesn't affect. You know, like it's all older people, people who are out of school. So it's like, I'm not reaping the benefits of it. Like the benefits that they reap are long-term, you know, Mm -hmm. it's, it's an improvement of people as a whole, not, you know, something local to them. You know, it's, it doesn't affect me now, Yeah, but it would affect affect you in 20 to 30 years when you're working alongside a lot of those people. There's a lot of shows that aren't classified as superhero shows that are really superhero shows. A lot of those like uh FBI or Well, like CSI CIA like or and CSI CI What the fuck am I trying to say? <laughs> what are you trying to say? NCIS? No. CSI? Well, CSI, that's what I was going to say. CSI and then it, like NCIS, like, to me, is, like, the obvious choice for, like, shows that are just, like, basically they're superheroes. Because, like, the things, for one thing, they are, like, the embodiment of perfection at everything that they do. They're never wrong. I Honestly, I don't know how those shows, like, stayed around for as long as they have. Because they fucking suck. But like I'm addicted to watching them, like they're they're just they're terrible movies or ter- terrible shows. Like their plots are extremely predictable. Kind of going back to like the fact that the characters are perfect, so you can basically guess like if a character uh, doesn't agree with something or. Like if they have a feeling about something or, or if something is against them. So like, oh, they, you know, they, they're suspected of something. It's like, you can almost guarantee they did not do it and they're going to figure out who did. And it's like my, my favorite thing about like the NCIS shows is they always do that, like freeze frame stop. And like every time, like they, they, so they start out and they do, they show you the freeze frame. Yeah. And then they go back into the into the show. Then they go back into the show and play through it. And then, like, right before they cut to commercial, they go back to that original freeze frame. And I every time, though, I'm just like, oh, there it is. Like, I'm still always so, like, shocked when they, like, reveal what the like what was happening in the freeze frame. And it's always something completely different than what you think was, like, actually going on. Yeah. I don't know. It's just like some episodes are good. I feel like I've watched because I've been like basically like grinding through NCIS for a couple months now. But I'm on like season five. 
Mm-hmm. I don't even know how many seasons are like are total, but I'm not sure. It's just like I don't know. I'm so over like the uh uh the biochemist or whatever the whatever the chick. Abby. Abby. Like I'm so fucking over her. <laughs> like all those shows she, have somebody like that. Just like uh But it's like she's such a fucking child. Like her her character is essentially you're a super genius, but you act like a fucking nine year old. Like it is so obnoxious. I, I want any time a character actually like it seems like they did something wrong or that they fucked up, I cheer for them to like actually have the characters fuck up. Because they never do. And so it's all, it's so predictable. You that- should try watching Criminal Minds. Oh it's God. like the same thing as NCIS. Oh, yeah. But instead of being uh, Navy, it's, it's the FBI. Yeah. Yeah. No, I watched through most of, uh, I don't think I finished Criminal, Criminal Minds because I think it was a similar thing where I just started to get annoyed by it. Yeah. It's, they're all the same formula. Yeah. And it, it's weird when you like, if you really take a look at TV and entertainment, like you start to see formulas on things and you can, you can watch even a new show, like a new show on Netflix and you can watch it and you like, you see those patterns and you can figure out like, okay, they're either going to do this or this depending on what they want to do. And then you can kind of evaluate their writing. Um, my girlfriend, she was watching a new show on Netflix called, uh, I can't remember what it's called, but it, it it's event, it's essentially this, there's this guy who he got a job at a bookstore and the bookstore owner was kind of screwed up and had like a very like particular way of like teaching lessons, okay. including as far as like locking this guy into this, like away from the elf elements elephants <laughs> away from the away elephants. from the elephants away from the elements like chamber that like kept the books like pristine condition okay and so like but this guy was like a super stalker and so like he developed this crush on somebody and he goes as far as like stealing her phone gaining access to her phone and like influencing her to fall in love with him yeah. okay and so like this whole series is based on that and he he makes her fall in love with him and like the writing's not terrible yeah but you can you can watch it and you can decide like okay this plot point's coming up and they can you, take you one you just of, feel it you yeah like, like and you you can take one or two routes it's like okay they're either going to do this and you know that they want to explore more into like why this person did it and maybe like do some more character development. Yeah. Or they're going to do this and just maybe kill off a character because they don't want to delve into that. And they just want lazy writing. And like, I don't know to me that like that makes or breaks a show is what route they take. And like, unfortunately on this one, a lot of times they took the, we just kill off this person. Really? And I feel like that's a lot of shows now is they're just like, it's just lazy writing. And like, again, if you can go back and you kind of are aware of these patterns on different shows, you see them and you're like, okay, I already know what's going to happen. That's one of the reasons I like the new Avengers movie because like you can watch that whole thing. And even if you like read the comics, you kind of get an idea of like what's going to happen. Yeah. But at the end of that movie, when like everybody starts vanishing, you're like, Oh shit. Like they didn't win, and yeah. So, like, which you, like you kind of get blindsided by how the story went. Yeah, because in everything else, like the heroes always win. Yeah, and they they have to win. Well, and that's kind of like why I actually really enjoy like the Marvel movies in general, is that like they don't always win, or or they don't always win to the degree that you kind of are expecting them well that's to. the turn they've kind of been taking in these later movies in the universe yeah. i think that's something that dc should start to do like if they want to get ahead of marvel or at least maybe not get catch ahead up, but like catch least. up to them is they need to take their characters and take their universe which they try 
to be darker and yeah. actually make them darker. Yeah. Well, DC, what they seem to be doing is that they try to be dark. So like they have, they make everything dark. Like the sets are like a very serious, dark film. Uh, the imagery that they have is very dark and mature, but their storylines are very much childlike. They're very yeah. like, PG kind of story. People aren't going to die. There's not going to be a huge tragedy that yeah. drives the story forward. It's just something basic that happens and then like that propels the entire plot. No, give us more like the Dark Knight where like there was actually like consequences to people. There was darkness in there. Batman doesn't win at the end of that. Like he's now on the run. Yeah. And, like that's the thing is that I actually think like the Dark Knight, one of the big reasons why it was so successful is just because it kind of it, it didn't show it wasn't a fairy fairy tale ending or it wasn't like your traditional comic book ending. It was it more was, of a villain movie than it was a superhero oh, movie. Oh for sure. Well, I mean that was honestly because like they had such a good villain with mm-hmm. Heath Ledger that uh like he was such a good joker that they could make a movie basically about him. And like, it was almost kind of like Batman was like along for the ride. Yeah. You know, like I think, I think the most interesting aspect of that movie was the Joker, but I mean, you still got to give them props for like, you know, making it so that way, uh, like leaving you with the Batman was not this perfect being that was always going to win. Like, yes, he still kind of won in a de- to a sense, like uh, to a degree. Like he he did win because he was sort of the the hero that the city needed, but not what they deserved, kind of a thing. Like, if I you mean, didn't make that reference, I was going. To. <laughs> I mean, it's but it's like super true to like. That to to how that movie ended, like it wasn't, he didn't make everything perfect. It, it, It was that he didn't make everything perfect, but it was what needed to happen. People need like the, in that scenario, the city needed somebody to hate collectively. We needed to like group together and like have a common enemy and if that needed to be the Batman, then so be it kind of a thing. Uh, I think that's that's such like a dangerous and like like risky move to make on the part of the writers and producers of that movie. And it did so well, I think, for it. Why do they not think that that's going to like happen again or or at least like that that's not a good way to think about it that's that's something that i don't get is like why don't we have more movies that are like realistic and like dark do you think that the nfl is rigged or staged scripted no no i uh, no because like <sighs> I, I don't watch a lot of NFL, so it's tough for me to like totally say whether or not something like that would be going on. But from what I do see, like rigging something like that, though, would be extremely difficult because you would have to like have a lot of players in it, like, well, literally players actually like participating in like actively trying to like sabotage it. I don't I mean I guess then again, how many people does it really take to bring down, you know, to ruin a game, you know, or I think even refs like make mistakes, but sometimes well, I think, it's like I think really refs is kind of where I I start to believe where it might be cuz you're right. I think it's really hard to get the players in. Yeah. Especially to keep it a secret. That um, that's the thing is that I think that if there is any amount of rigging going on, it would have to be so like small because I think that people suck at keeping secrets, mm-hmm. 
this is a whole other thing, but that, that's kind of my, my, the foundation for why I don't really believe a lot of like the conspiracy theories is because I just don't trust that people wouldn't be able to tell other people. Yeah. You know, they would tell their wives or, you know, their best friends. And then those people who have less to lose would then probably tell other people, you know, it's like, I, I just don't trust that people are that responsible. <laughs> so I think that's a valid point. Yeah. That's kind of the foundation of all of that stuff. But anyway, kind of back to this, uh, it still kind of holds up. Like if there is like cheating or something like that, it must be on a very, some very like high level people, but very few. Yeah. I think what they have Instead of being like, all right, this team's going to win this game. Yeah. I think they have, we would prefer that this team wins this game for such and such reason. Mm -hmm. And then they kind of convey that to officials or whoever. Be like, hey, like, we need you to, like, try to make this happen. Yeah. Just kind of. So, like, refs miss a call that was kind of crucial or, I don't know, something like. Maybe it even goes as far as like you have a team that's doing a blowout up till halftime, and then in the locker room they are like, "Hey, if you go out there and like just make terrible play calls for the second half, yeah, and we'll give you I don't know a hundred thousand, whatever, maybe some amount or something, some kind of compensation, or even just like favor, yeah, you know, it's like then well, it allows this other team to maybe catch up, and then if they're playing well enough, they kind of do. It makes for a more exciting game." Having never played in like a football game myself, yeah. like on any athletic level, more than just in the backyard, I don't know if there's really like going into halftime with a huge lead, just being like, yeah, fuck it, we got it. And then coming out and playing a completely different to the point where like you lose 21 points. Like it just seems crazy. But then as fans, we love that crazy. Yeah. And so I, I feel like there's some kind of an influence. Not so much like scripted games, but just some kind of influence to try to sway it in a direction. Well, in like, especially when you're talking about people playing at the highest, like, uh, the highest skill, like players. And like, I mean, these are the best of the best. They're playing this sport. Very small things can have huge consequences you know, kind of like what you say, like a play call, one bad play call could then spiral out of control. And at that point, that one thing, like uh, there was only one thing that was rigged, but because of that one thing, it, no matter what you could do, even if you made the best play calls, you know, after that, like maybe you couldn't save it. It's just, their morale just took that little bit of a hit and it boosted the other team's morale just a little bit to the point where now it's basically completely out of your hands. You know, mm-hmm. it's like no matter what you do, I guess morale, they're going to like start stomping. You know? Yeah. Morale at the, at that level probably does play more of an impact than oh yeah, like anything skill wise, I guess at like maybe a high school level. I think in more so with like those with like, highly active sports like i don't know but then even like if you think like esports and stuff it's like i think morale does play a huge role in like the decision making in the heat of the moment so it's like you know just being like a little bit off your game being upset about something just means that like you don't take that risk that would have then maybe ultimately won you the game Mm -hmm. you know maybe you play something a little bit safer you know or maybe you don't think about something your your mind's off on something else but so i think definitely at that high of a level yeah morale is a bigger deal than like you know in high school it's like yeah you can be like have a rough day and still go out and it's like well i got raw skill but it's like everybody out there in, in, in the NFL, everybody has raw skills. So the, there has to be something else that's, yeah, you know, taking over on like how well you're going to be doing that day. But So on this football topic tonight being Super Bowl Sunday, yep. we have the Rams and the Patriots. Who do you have winning it? 
Well, again, based off of my very limited football knowledge, I think the Patriots, I mean, I, it's just tough to like, I, I haven't really followed the Rams and to know, and I don't know like how well they're doing. Maybe they have been just like killing it and maybe the Patriots, you know, they're kind of just doing their normal. They're, they're good, you know, but I don't know. It's just, and I also don't know like all the things of like who's hurt and stuff like mm-hmm. that, but I don't know, just like having seen the Patriots play before, knowing what Tom Brady is kind of capable of, it's tough not to kind of put them as the favored okay. pick. But I'm gonna preface preface this. I'm gonna preface this with I think both teams are good this year, mm-hmm. and I wouldn't mind either team winning. Okay, but. That being said, I'm going to go with the Rams winning it. I wouldn't be surprised if the Patriots do because, I, like I said, I think they've been very good all year. Yeah. I think the Rams being there and going to L.A. as a team, I think that's going to look really good for the NFL. It's going to help build fans. And so I have a it, it's, kind of going on that. It's like, my is conspiracy it theorist kind of, kind of mentality for it. I feel like things are probably influenced in their favor tonight to try to get them there. I think that's part of the reason why, and I'm not a Saints fan by saying this, but yeah. I think maybe that's why they had a better shot to get into the Super Bowl than the Saints in that last NFC championship game. But they're here. They're, like I said, both teams have played great all season. I think the Rams are going to take it. So that'll be interesting. It'll, it'll be interesting to see if like, especially if something like sketchy were to happen. Right. Yeah. If there is like a blown call, which I mean, even then it almost sucks because it almost feels like if you really look at, you know, every single NFL game, probably most games have blown calls. Oh yeah. There's always so going to like, be something that the refs didn't see. Yeah. It's like, but I, I think that's kind of where like some of the, uh, you know, if you're really into conspiracy theories, that's where they kind of get bred where it's right. like, you know, it's like, here's this thing. Our test is going to be, do the Rams win? And maybe some like supporting evidence would be if there's like a bad play or a bad call by the refs. But you can almost guarantee there's going to be a bad call by the refs. It's mm-hmm. just, is that bad call going to, uh, like, sway the game? Maybe it does. Maybe it doesn't. You know, it's more, you know, it's your opinion, I guess, of, like, how severe the bad call was. And mm-hmm. then next thing you know, you're like, dude, <laughs> the yeah. Illuminati has control over the NFL. <laughs> like... I, if that ref would have called it properly, then the other team would have won. And yeah, you know, but um, as long as it's a good game, small tangent there. That's but, that's all I care about. And oh yeah, oh, I think that that's what I think. It'd know, be, a lot of people they just want a good game. Yeah, you know, I think it'd be cool if uh, Tom Brady gets a sixth ring. Like that's awesome. Like that's never been done. Yeah. So you know, watching it tonight, if that happens, we're watching history. If you know, the Rams go ahead and do it, then, I mean, that's just good on them. And for sure, like the, um, kind of going back, like if there is any kind of collusion or cheating going on in the NFL, I think the best outcome would be for the Rams to win. So it's like, I don't know. It will kind of like, it's almost interesting that it's like, yeah, like, because like, I just feel like everybody is tired of the Patriots just winning. Oh, yeah. You know, so it's like... Well, and they've gotten there on questionable things as well. I mean, yeah. you have Deflate Gate, you have the Surveillance Gate, you have the doping scandals that some of the players have had. Like, it's it's craziness, but... Yeah. Again, at the end of the day, it comes down to hopefully it's a good game, and that's really about it. Yeah, it's just entertainment, so... Go forth and play your silly children's game. What are your thoughts on uh, college players not getting paid for playing? I think what it was originally, why it was originally put in there 
or why why that rule was kind of created with the NCAA is not really applicable to today. Like I, I think when it originally it was put in place that the players aren't allowed to get paid and stuff like that, it is more to like protect the players mm-hmm. and stuff. And I think anymore it's now they're using it as a kind of kind of a way to like get out of having to pay them. You know, it's like right. it's it's not it's now not there to protect the players. It's there for them to be able to make more money. Yeah, it does you seem know, like it's, it's a way to protect the schools from having to pay. Yeah. Now, part of this, so like kind of what usually brings this up is towards the end of the college football season when you have the bowl games, you have a lot of seniors or people that are going into the draft decide, oh, I'm going to sit out this game. And it yeah. always ticks off the fans of like, you're giving up on your team, you're giving up on your brothers, like we need you to play. But at the same time, it's not worth when it, they could go into the NFL draft, get drafted, and then like they're making millions. Yeah. And if they play this one game, they get hurt. Yeah. Perfect example Jake Butt for Michigan. He played in his last bowl game and tore his ACL. That's insane. He was a guaranteed first round pick, I, hypothetically, but more than likely because he tore his ACL, he didn't get drafted until very late. He still got drafted, but I mean, he's yet to really play. Yeah. Luckily he had an insurance policy that if he were to get hurt in that game, he'd get a million dollars. But if he would have been drafted first round pick, went and played for a team, like he could have potentially already had millions. Oh yeah. Yeah. No, he would, he would be doing way better if he hadn't, played that game and yeah. honestly i don't blame the players for taking that like that precaution right of just skipping the game it's like i'm not getting paid and you know what i, I if if the ncaa doesn't like it you know if they see well the fans hate that the players are skipping it i i would be extremely upset <laughs> like this would be something i'd, I'd probably rally behind like if we started to see the NCAA forcing players to play. Mm-hmm. And I'm glad and they like, have the choice for yeah. like, if they don't want to play this game, they don't have to. Yeah. Cause like, that's the thing is that if the, if the NCAA was like, okay, you have to play this game, then like then pay me for it. Like, right. cause, cause the schools make ridiculous money shit. on every game. Yeah. I shouldn't have to do shit for free. Yeah. If you want me there, you can pay me to be there, but like, I don't know. That's a tough sell to be like, well, you know, yeah. now, you have to support your team. Or I don't, know, I don't know how they would justify it. But the one thing I don't like about the so like college athletes should be paid. Yeah. Is in a way they get compensation. It's yeah. not necessarily a check at the end of the week, but like they get free room and board. They get tuition to these schools. Which is potentially hundreds of thousands exactly. of dollars. Exactly. Like if you of, go to play for Ohio yeah. State, Wisconsin, like any Big Ten school, any SEC school, like easily those universities to get a degree at, you're going to come out with, if you, I mean, hundreds of thousands of dollars in debt. Oh, yeah. And so like if they're like, yeah, you play football for us and we're going to cover all that. I mean, that's good. Not to mention like especially these big teams – like they, when they get into these bowl games, like you get gifts for doing that. Um, one, I know one of the schools in the MAC when they got into like the Little Caesars Bowl, mm-hmm. like everybody that was on the team, and this included like training staff, like the team manager or whatever, like all them, they got iPad minis, and like that was the first year the iPad minis came out. Oh, really? Like I know. D3 teams like they go and they win the championship like they their championship ring that they get from that is like gigantic and just encrusted with diamonds and yeah, sapphires yeah, they're like no joke yeah like that ring isn't just some cheap you know $50 <laughs> Jostens ring like yeah. that's easily a couple hundred dollars so like they do well, get if compensation it has diamonds, it's easily a couple thousand yeah probably yeah. and so like they definitely get compensation and they get perks of doing that so I yeah. I can't really say like yeah they should all get paid like they don't get anything because they do yeah they, they do perks. get some sort of compensation for 
their work. I think that where it becomes where people start to really have a problem with it is when you start to see that, like, well, when you start to see how much the schools are making by comparison. Yeah. That gap you know, between even those perks and compensation, you know, the school still, you know, per game is making like $2 million way, or yeah, something, you know, way more than whatever, you know, that, that hundred thousand dollars for over the course of four years, isn't actually that great. You know, yeah. when you consider that, you know, 48 games that they might play in or something is, you know, that's bringing the school like a, just a shit ton of money. Well, a shit ton of money. And that's a, that's a big risk. It's a lot of effort. You're probably putting in well over 40 hours a week in, in just your, uh, your football stuff. Like you're, probably put in like for how much time that they probably have to do practices then workouts afterwards and then studying uh 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 playbooks and just like all that stuff it has to be ridiculous at least it has to be close to 40 hours a week Mm -hmm. on top of that you have to go to classes and do all of that now that's what you're kind of there to do i I don't know exactly how that fits in it all depends Um, on if you're an athlete student or a student athlete yeah the university likes to say yeah they're student athletes but but (laughs) a lot of times it seems to be more their athlete students yeah you know they come out just because like they have the hopes of getting drafted in the nfl or yeah yeah they're not really maybe doing as much as the other kids are doing as far as the academic side. Yeah. And they're still, don't get me wrong. Like there's definitely some athletes that do work hard and are really good students on top of being excellent athletes. Um, but you can't like, I think it's foolish to just go into it thinking that, they're, that they're all like that, you mm-hmm. know, it's, there's going to be people who, you know, probably are, are leaving college still with a high school level education. Like they really didn't learn anything. Yeah. They just, you know, they skated by on all their exams. You know, maybe they learned just enough to get a D, which then they got bumped up to a C, you know, mm-hmm. it's that kind of stuff that. I mean, and that stuff has to happen. You just can't imagine that it never does. But yeah, I don't know. Like, definitely, like the student, they are getting compensated a little bit, and especially kind of like breaking it down to where it's like, even if, like, let's say, I mean, I don't know exactly. Like, I, I know for us, like my student loans, like in total, were close to a hundred thousand dollars. So like let's say like a a Big Ten school, you're looking at I don't know 150, 200 thousand, oh, yeah. you know. To go to Michigan University of Michigan, I believe is a hundred. Gosh, I I, I want to say it's like a hundred thousand a year. Oh, a year. A year. Jesus, it's expensive. So I mean, I guess that. If you're, if you're, I guess if you're getting that level of education where it is like a hundred thousand, you're, you're basically making a hundred thousand dollars a year playing sports and going to school. I don't know. That to me kind of does when it's framed like that does make sense. That does seem like fairly reasonable compensation for the work that you're doing. But I also kind I mean, I guess I do get it as well. It's like, that's not money that you can then pay for your apartment. You know, that's not, that's not getting you groceries, you know, at the end of the week. It's, you know, and I think in many cases, it's something that you may not use ever again. It's kind of just, you know, yeah, you're getting an education, but you may never use that education if you're going into NFL, you know? Okay, I was apparently way off. Oh, it, I mean, it still looks to be around like seventy five thousand, but oh, so like seventy five thousand dollars a year. Yeah. Well, I mean, still, yeah. I mean, even seventy five thousand dollars a year. That I mean, that's yeah. It, you're looking at you know thirty thousand dollar differences and nothing, but 
but still a lot more than maybe they do that though just because like if you got paid more to be at like a big 10 school which would most likely be the case all these private colleges maybe wouldn't be able to afford it and there'd probably be a drop in attendance if i can go play for osu versus playing for i don't know hillsdale college like yeah i'm gonna go do that yeah for sure hey everybody thank you for listening to another beer den review don't forget to follow us on social media links down in the description subscribe like and share and if there are any beers you would like us to try out leave them in the comments below we'll see you on the next episode of the beer den podcast